as we make sure that our method is without deficiency and that nothing is lacking, we must also make sure that it is short, concise, without more words than is needed. There are several rules to help the method be full to enlarge our knowledge, but also brief to save our time. Number one, avoid needlessly repeating the same thing in different parts of your discourse. Sometimes it will be necessary to review a previous proposition in order to explain the next one, but organize your method so that you will have the fewest rehearsals of the same thing. Number two, do not extend or draw out any part of your discourse to an unnecessary and tiresome length. Three, do not have lengthy explanations where there is no difficulty, confusion, or danger of mistake. Do not feel as though every single word of your theme must be explained through their grammatical or logical meanings. Do not try to impress your audience or reader with your knowledge by going through each one of your words and their various senses, the etymology of the terms, the synonyms and the antonyms, etc., where the chief and main point of discourse does not require it. Number four, avoid proving those things that need no proof, such as self-evident propositions and truths that are universally confessed and that are entirely already agreed to and granted to by our opponents. Number five, just as there are some things that are so evidently true that they lack no proof, so there are others that are so evidently false that they really want no refutation. Number six, do not allow every occasional thought to carry you away into a long parenthesis, always adding extra or incidental thoughts here and there. Doing so will stretch out your discourse and divert you away from the point in hand. In summary, the balance we want to achieve in our method is not to be so short that parts are obscure and the argument feeble, but also not so long that it wastes our time, tire the learner, or fill the mind with trifles and impertinencies. Take care that your method be proper to the subject at hand, proper to your present design, proper to the age and place where you dwell, and that it is tailored to your audience. For example, this treatise on logic is one instance. Its method is considerably different from others who have written on the subject, and they differ also from other writers, even though many of them are well written. You will find that some subjects need more explaining than proving. For example, when many of the chief and most important doctrines of Scripture are clearly explained, they appear so evident in the light of nature or Scripture that they lack no other proof. The last requirement of method is that the parts of a discourse should be well connected. Keep your main end and design ever in view and let all the parts of your discourse have a tendency toward it. As far as possible, make that tendency visible all the way, otherwise your readers or hearers may wonder for what reason this or that particular was introduced and where you are going with it. Let the relationship and dependence of the different parts of your discourse be so just and evident that every part may naturally lead onward to the next, without any huge breaks which interrupt and deform the scheme. Acquaint yourself with all the proper and decent forms of transition from one part of a discourse to another, and practice them as occasion offers. It makes the discourse much more agreeable when proper and graceful expression joins the parts of it together, in so entertaining a manner that the reader knows not how to leave off till he hath arrived at the end.